സഹായിക്കുന്നുണ്ട് ജയമം സ്റ്റഡി സെന്ററിന് വേണ്ടി സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുന്നു ദീർഘവർഷമായിട്ട് കർത്താവ് സമൂഹത്തിന്റെ വലിയ താളവും അതിന്റെ ആവശ്യങ്ങളും ഒക്കെ മനസ്സിലാക്കി പ്രവർത്തിപ്പാൻ തക്കവണ്ണം അവർക്ക് സഹായിക്കുന്നുണ്ട് സ്ത്രോത്രം കർത്താവ് ദിവസങ്ങളിൽ ക്രമീകരിച്ചിരിക്കുന്ന ഈ ലെക്ചർ സീരീസിനെ ഓർത്ത് സ്ത്രോത്രം ചെയ്യുന്നു സയൻസ് ആൻഡ് ടെക്നോളജിയെ കുറിച്ചൊക്കെ പഠിക്കുവാൻ തക്കവണ്ണം ഞങ്ങളുടെ കുഞ്ഞുങ്ങളെ ഞങ്ങളെയൊക്കെ അവിടുന്ന് സഹായിക്കുന്നു ഇന്ന് ഈ ലെക്ചർ നേർ നൽകുന്ന ഇൻക്രെഡിബിൾ വേൾഡ് ഓഫ് ഫ്ലൈങ് മെഷീൻസ് എന്ന വിഷയത്തെ ആസ്പദമാക്കി ഇന്ന് ഈ സീരീസിന് നേർ നൽകുന്ന ജാസ്പർ ലാൽ സാറിന് വേണ്ടി ഞാൻ ഏറ്റവും നന്നായിട്ട് ഈ വിഷയം കമ്മ്യൂണിക്കേറ്റ് ചെയ്യുവാൻ തക്ക സാറിനെ സഹായിക്കണമേ ഇതിൽ പങ്കുചേരുന്ന കുഞ്ഞുങ്ങളെ പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് മറ്റു നേർ നൽകുന്ന എല്ലാവരെയും വാഴ്ത്തും നേർ നൽകുന്ന അഭിമുഖത്തിൽ വേണിക്കായി ഡയറക്ടറായി പ്രവർത്തിക്കുന്ന ജെയിംസ് അച്ഛനായി മറ്റ് കമ്മിറ്റി അംഗങ്ങൾക്കായി സ്ത്രോത്രം ചെയ്യുന്നു ഇന്നത്തെ മീറ്റിംഗ് ഇന്നത്തെ ഈ സെഷൻ ഏറെ അനുഗ്രഹപൂർണമായി തീരണം ഞങ്ങളുടെ കുഞ്ഞുങ്ങളുടെ കർത്താവിയുടെ മുന്നോട്ടുള്ള വളർച്ചയിൽ പഠനത്തിൽ അവരുടെ സംശയങ്ങൾ പരിഹരിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് കർത്താവ് സയൻസ് ആൻഡ് ടെക്നോളജിയിലെ പുത്തൻ കർത്താവ് കാര്യങ്ങൾ അതിന്റെ ദർശനം ഉൾക്കൊണ്ടുകൊണ്ട് കൂടുതൽ കാര്യങ്ങൾ പഠിച്ച് മുന്നേറുവാൻ തക്കവണ്ണം അവരെ സഹായിക്കണം അവരുടെ തുടർന്നുള്ള ഭാവിയുടെ എല്ലാ കാര്യങ്ങളിലും അവർക്ക് കൂടെ അവർ സഹായിക്കണം ഈ മീറ്റിംഗിനെ അവിടുന്ന് അനുഗ്രഹിക്കണമേ പ്രാർത്ഥന ഘട്ടത്തിനായി സ്തോത്രം യേശുവിൻ നാമത്തിൽ തന്നെ ആമേ
solution of case. Please. Yes. Yes. Thank you, sir. Gaining knowledge is the first step to wisdom, but sharing knowledge is the first step to humanity. Good morning, one and all present here. My name is Sri Krishna Satyajit from Rajagiri Public School, Kalamashi. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this fabulous lecture series organized by the JMM Study Center. On this auspicious Friday, I'm honored to welcome Mr. Jasper Lal to this platform to share his knowledge on the science behind flying machines. Mr. Jasper Lal is the former group head of the propulsion group at the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center of ISRO. Being a bright man with a futuristic attitude, Mr. Jasper Lal is one of the most experienced in the field of solid rocket propulsion. He graduated in aeronautical engineering from the ST and IIT Bombay and completed his post graduation in aeronautical engineering from the prestigious IIT Madras. After a stint in private industry, Mr. Jasper Lal joined VSSC in 1984 and retired as a senior scientist in 2017. His main work in VSSC was in the field of solid rocket propulsion. He has contributed to the design and analysis of the propulsion systems of the ISRO satellite launch vehicles, the ASLV, PSLV, GSLV, and also the GSLV Mark III. He has applied and research in propulsion systems and established several research and development facilities in ISRO. He has about 30 international publications, and he is also a life member of the Aeronautical Society, the Astronautical Society, and the High Energy Materials Society of India, and also a fellow of the Institution of Engineers. I would like to thank Reverend Dr. Keen Jameson, the Associate Director of the JMM Study Center, and Dr. K. N. Naina, a former outstanding scientist of ISRO and the convener of the program, for organizing this magnificent lecture series on science and everyday topics. Dr. D. P. Sivadas, a VSSC scientist, for answering all our doubts towards the end of the lectures and all the technical and media team behind the screens, ensuring a good and disturbing free lecture series. Last but not the least, I'd like to thank all the teachers and parents for encouraging and motivating us to attend this amazing lecture series. I welcome our honorable principal of Rajgiri Public School, Reverend Father Vergis Kachapilli CMI, who will be attending the lecture series along with us. I'm sure that the spark Mr. Jaspalal ignites in our minds will not be extinguished quickly. Rather, it will be the main force that will drive our lives to imagine and explore a time when we will be flying across the globe in flying cars. And I'm sure all the students are eagerly waiting for the lecture series to start. So once again, a very warm welcome to everyone present in this lecture series. Sir, the stage is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sri Krishna, for uh, your very nice and kind words of introduction. And at the outset, uh, I would like to thank uh, Nainan sir for uh, this opportunity, the opportunity that I've got today to interact with a large number of students. Um, it's uh, I am extremely grateful to Nainan sir. And uh, as you would have understood by now, you know I had the honor and pleasure of working in the same organization as him for about uh, 30, 40 years. And uh, let me slightly elaborate, you know, I was, uh, I've been a member of many of the committees where Nainan sir has been the chairman. So I must at least now tell him it has been a most pleasurable experience. You know, uh, many of these committee meetings, uh, especially failure analysis committees and all, intense pressure, intense pressure he will be working under. Never he has chair a meeting without a smile. Always the smile on his face. Never I have seen him losing his temper. And always humorous. Under the extreme pressure, he'll crack jokes. So it's a honor to be uh, here today. And I'm extremely happy that you know he brought me here today. And uh, I'm extremely thankful to JMM Study Center and Achamar and these um, officials for such a wonderful work uh, they have been doing. I've been listening to many of the lectures so far. And I understand also so it's a wonderful it's a wonderful program whatever they have been doing. So I really uh, take this opportunity to wish all success uh, for the future endeavors. 
And let me also welcome and thank all the students who are present today. It's a pleasure to be with you people today. And I do hope that you are enjoying and learning from uh, today's lecture. And uh, I would like to now start off by sharing uh, my screen. Shall I go ahead with share screening? Yes, sir. Yes, the title for today's talk is the Incredible World of Flying Machines. Okay. Now, uh, let's go back a bit, maybe a few thousand years ago, uh, you know, when there were no flying machines, the only flying machines available were birds. You see here, beautiful view of birds flying at different stages. So our ancestors in those days, you know, thousands of years ago, when they looked up in the sky, they had no other mode of locomotion except walking or running. So they all looked up in the sky and saw the birds flitting around and they had wish. We had all been birds instead of humans. So that was one of the wishes. And people being people, they attempted all kinds of uh, tricks and mothers to fly. One of the oldest legends, you know, many of you will be familiar with this legend, the legend of Icarus. It's uh, from the Greek mythology. Icarus was a young man who was trapped in a maze along with his father, who was actually a skilled craftsman. So the father, you know, they had no way of escaping from this maze. It was a very complex maze. And uh, so the father came out with an idea that they will paste feathers all over the body of uh, themselves using wax. And then they will fly out of the maze. So that's what they put to use. They both of them pasted feathers all over their body and they took off. They flew. And the father actually warned the son that don't go too close to the sun. If you go too close to the sun, there's likelihood that the wax will melt but this young chap being a very enthusiastic and dynamic person, he did not obey his father. He flew too close to the sun and you can see the result. The poor fellow, the wax melted and he had to take a dive. Yeah. So this is an old legend of Icarus, which you will be familiar with. And meanwhile, you know, people continued their desperate attempt to fly. And simplest mother to do was, you know, imitate the birds. So what these people will do, they'll climb trees. They'll paste feathers all over their body, fix some kind of wings and climb on top of trees or small hillocks and then try to take off. And you can imagine what would have happened to the poor fellows. Most of them would have broken their limbs and uh, so on. So it went on like that for centuries and for thousands of years. But today, today you just see this picture here, what I'm showing you. This is a helicopter which is taken to Mars and which has flown on Mars. Many of you know its name is Ingenuity. A few months back we had it flying on the surface of Mars, which is unimaginable, incredible. So how could we do all these things? How could the humans do all this from a helpless state where we were bound to the ground with our flight to a stage where we are able to go to another planet and operate flying machines there? So it's a really an incredible journey. In the short time available, I'll try to give you an exposure to this whole picture. A little bit of um, uh, technical things only, and most of the talk I'll try to keep it general so that the whole idea is to get you interested in it and make you understand the basics, okay? So there are basically two kinds of flight possible. Now you can imagine very well, you know, you have, if you, you can float, if you are able to float, flight is possible. So what can float actually anything lighter than air? Now you already studied in your school that if you have hot gas, it will rise. So you take, if you take a balloon, actually you take a balloon and fill it with hot gas, or you pump it up with the hydrogen or helium, which are all lighter than air and allow them free, they will fly. You see here, beautiful flight of balloons, which are probably filled with helium or hydrogen. I'm sure that many of you people have done this, you know, in, when you've gone to fairs or to exhibitions and all that, your parents would have purchased some balloon and given to you in your hand and you happily, proudly carried this balloon along. And then sometimes you would have released the balloon. And the balloon would have kept on rising, 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 and finally disappeared from your view. So where did this balloon go? I'm not addressing now. I would like, like you people to spare a few minutes to think about it after this lecture. You please go home. Just think what happens to a light then air balloon when you release it, okay? 
So that is how you achieve flight. When you release something lighter than air, it continues to fly or it rises. Now, this whole thing was put to use or rather in 1783, in the year 1783, the first successful lighter than air balloon flight was achieved. So you see here a picture from those historical times in the year 1783 when a hydrogen balloon was released in the air. This happened in France. And they followed the path of the balloon. You know, the people on horseback followed and they chased the balloon. It flew for 21 kilometers. And then it began to sink. Somewhere the hydrogen obviously leaked and the balloon began to sink over a village. And you can imagine that it was about 250 years back. The villagers got terrified and they came out with all their weapons. You can see here the fellows are carrying an axe, pitchfork, spear, knife. And even the village dog has joined the mess. Even you can see a dog attacking the balloon. All of them together tore the balloon to pieces. So that was the first lighter than air successful flight. And in the same year, 1783 was a very successful year for a balloon flight. The same year, the first hot air balloon was flown. And uh, the very first passengers who flew in a hot air balloon actually were a chicken, a pig and a duck. They put these three things in a container below the balloon and allowed it to fly. It flew for around nine kilometers and then came down. The same year, in December of 1783, the first humans flew for a short distance. So that was the first flight when humans really left the earth and actually flown. Okay, that was a balloon flight. And balloon flight continued to be practiced in the next 100, 200 years. And I'm sure most of you know a very famous uh, science writer, science fiction writer called Jules Verne, a fantastic writer. In fact, most of his science fiction has come true by now. He has predicted uh, going to the moon. He has predicted flight. He has gone, you know, you might have even read the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So many books he has written. Most of them have come true. So here, this was a very adventurous, beautiful book, which I have read long back. Many of you have read also. Five weeks in a balloon where they have a hot air balloon. And three men, you know, go in a carriage, which is hung below the balloon. And they travel all over uh, the world. It's a beautiful book. And if you get the time, please do read it. It's just a suggestion from me. And so balloon flight continued in the next 200 years. And then we came to a stage, you know, around 1900, where we had airships. It's a beautiful machine. You see here, it is much longer than a ship. It is anchored to a ship. You can see that here. And it's very long and graceful. They fly around 150, 100, 150 million, uh, kilometer per hour speed. And, you know, they beautifully move. And they used to carry passengers. You can see that on the front left side. On the bottom, you have a box-like structure where it's a cabin, passenger cabin. And they were operating from Europe to America and so on. So this thrived actually in the first, um, first half of uh, 1900s. In fact, up to 1935 or so, when they had a major accident when this was actually discontinued. But even today, people do come out with the occasional airships and uh, people fly it. It's a graceful thing. Today also it is flying occasionally. So whatever I've been telling you so far is about lighter than air flight. Now let's look at what is, okay, on last slide on that one. Nowadays also, you'll be occasionally seeing, you know, cross-country racing where people fly hot air balloons all over the country. I've seen in Trivandrum itself a few years ago, so many of them landed in Sandasayana Stadium and then they took off. So it's beautiful to see how these uh, hot air balloons fly. Okay. Now let's have a look at heavier than air flight. So how is it possible if you want to fly and you are heavier than air? This picture is one of the most popular and most well-known picture. I don't have to explain it. This is the first recorded flight, 1903, December 17. The location is Kitty Hawk in the USA. And you have the Wright brothers, Wilbur, uh, Wilbur Wright and Orville Wright. And so here you see one of those guys uh, lying down on the plane. Biplane. This is called a biplane. There are two wings. And you see the other guy standing on one side. He was supporting, in fact, the aircraft, the wing side. Without It should not fall down. And now he has let go of that one. And they flew for about uh, 120 meters. I'm sorry, 120 feet. They flew. The first flight was for a distance of 120 foot. And they were barely above the ground. Maybe around 10 feet above the ground. So that is how heavier than air flight started. This was the most defining image of a human flight, 1903. And so let me take a minute to explain to you how this uh, mechanism or how um, flight actually happens. Now, if something has to remain in the air, like this uh, small airplane, for example, 
the weight pulls it down. So you see here weight acting towards the ground. And as you all know, if you try to run through air, or if you stay, stay static and the air flows past you, you will be trying to push back. Air will push you back. That is known as drag. So in this picture, you see two uh, arrows. One is weight pulling you down and drag. If you start moving, the drag will keep you pushed back. So in steady flight, you have to overcome these two forces. Simple as that. Now for overcoming weight, we have to generate lift by some means. And to overcome drag, you have to generate thrust, which gives you a forward motion. So this is the simple mechanics of flight. And this is the equilibrium diagram when in steady flight. And how is uh, this done? Now, most of you would have, people would have flown kites, right? I'm sure that in vacation time, you people have gone to the beach and flown some kites or in your hometown, you have flown it. I have also done it a lot of times and thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, a, a kite you are flying, you know, with, um, with a string, a string. And uh, kites can generate enormous amount of lift. I'm sure that, you know, um, uh, you, many of you will be aware of this incident, which happened uh, just a few months ago. Uh, they had a kite flying competition in Taiwan. And a three-year-old child who was playing, you know, got entangled in the tail of a kite. And she was lifted off. You can see on the left side, you see the girl is stuck on the bottom of the kite's tail. And the kite lifted off. Poor child, uh, the thing almost, uh, you know, suffocated her and she had nothing to do. People luckily saw that this is uh, going on and they became uh, desperate and they took desperate measures. And in a few minutes, luckily, they were able to bring down the kite and the girl was uh, taken to safety. So this kite could fly with the weight of this child and still lift the lift to the skies. So how does a kite generate lift? Simple, whatever I've been telling you. The wind comes and you put a kite across it. The kite has a tail for stability. Gravity, of course, pulls it down, drag acts back. And because of the wind flow, there is a lift getting generated, acting up. And there's a tension of the string is actually at an angle. The tension of the string actually is counteracting the resultant of lift and drag. So the whole thing is well balanced, right? I hope you understood that one. Now, how lift is generated in an aeroplane? We have what is known as an aerofoil. This is what is known as an aerofoil. The wing cross section, if you cut the section of the wing, this is the shape you'll find in an aeroplane. This is known as an aerofoil. And so you have what is known as the flow, a streamline comes and splits from the uh, aerofoil. And, and the, on the bottom side, you have an area where low velocity comes because of the longer distance and you have higher pressure. And on the top of the aerofoil, you have lower pressure with a net result. If you integrate this pressure distribution, this is the picture you will get. On the top of the wing, you will have a low pressure area. And on the bottom, from the leading edge, you have what is known as a high pressure area. The net result being, you have a delta pressure acting towards the top, which is nothing but the lift. And when you multiply it with the area of the wing, you get a lift force. So that is what actually keeps your plane aloft. And for generating this lift, you need to actually have wind flowing across you. That's where you find before takeoff, you know, your pilot will take you taxi. You'll run for a long distance on the runway. You build up your velocity. And this lift force is actually function of velocity square. We'll not go into the detail. It's a function of the velocity square. That's why you will always find that once you leave or reach a particular velocity on the ground only, you will lift off. Okay. So this is the simple way of obtaining lift. That is how heavier than air machines fly. And now what about thrust? Thrust is quite simple, quite simple. And you know, either you have a propeller, you have a propeller, propeller can have many blades and you have a propeller here, propeller engine. And thrust equation is very simple. It's a Newton's law, rate of change of momentum, F equal to MA thrust, M into VE minus VA. It's only the change of velocity. The engine or the propeller accelerates the flow that is coming to it and sends it back with a higher velocity. So the rate of change of velocity gives you the thrust here. Nothing but it's a simple thrust equation. And sometimes, nowadays, most of the planes, we use what is known as a jet engine. A jet engine is a complex machine. It's a big engine with the producing enormous amount of thrust. It has various components like, uh, you know, uh, like a compressor. You have, you have an inlet and you have an inlet spike and a compressor and a combustion chamber, turbine, and then exhaust. 
And this can produce enormous amount of thrust in a continuous fashion. So we use either propeller engines or jet engines. These are the two modes of uh, thrust generation in an airplane. Okay. I think most of us will be clear. So now if you go back and look at an airplane, you have again the four forces, lift, weight, thrust and drag in equilibrium flight and steady flight, they are all balanced. Okay. Now, when one of them increases, obviously the plane will go in that direction. If lift becomes more than weight, plane will rise. The other way, it will come down forward motion, everything is very clear to you. And then we want to just mention to you about some more motions, you know, the plane, how you turn around, how you turn, how you bang, how you come into land and so on. There are three uh, basically actions available. You have the three axis, pitch axis, roll axis, and yaw axis, Y-A-W, yaw. So about the center of gravity, if you draw a line down, that becomes the yaw axis and you fly, you know, from left to right, that is yaw plane, you are moving, you are turning left, right, etc. And if you are pitching means your nose up or nose down, that is the pitching motion of a plane. And rolling is you are simply banking left or right, when you simply roll about the longitudinal axis, it's nothing but the um, rolling motion. So these are the basic three motions which are achieved by means of control surfaces. Now, this particular figure shows you the control surfaces in a plane and also the various components. You can, of course, you are familiar with most of it. You see the cockpit where the pilot sits and you have the fuselage where the people sit. And then you have the wing which generates lift. And on the wing, you have flaps. You have slats, you have spoilers, you have ailerons. And then you have the tail plane. And then you have the horizontal stabilizer. And then you have the vertical stabilizer. And then here the rudder, which actually helps you to yaw the plane, turn left, right, etc. And these ailerons and elevators help you to pitch up, put your nose up or nose down and so on. So sometimes you'll operate one side, sometimes you'll operate the control on the other side and so on. So it's all very simple. It's all aerodynamically done. All these controls are operated by the pilot and by increasing or changing the resistance and lift, etc., etc., all these forces are created, which actually keep the plane in the kind of motion which we want, okay? Now, aircraft can be classified into different, different types. You know, there are numerous ways we can classify an aircraft. We can say um, a propeller plane, we can say a jet engine plane, and by means of uh, operating purpose, we can say fighters, bombers, dive bombers, transport planes, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd like to show you some of them. Fighters, your, um, most of the people will be knowing about fighter planes. Now, you studied in your history classes that um, we had the First World War in 1914. 1914 to 1918 was the First World War. Second World War took place from 1939 to 1945. So these periods, unfortunately or fortunately, saw the greatest development in aircraft technology. Because by 1910, 1911, people realized you can use uh, planes to you know, attack your enemy. So they were put to great use in the First World War, 1914 onwards. So here you have a scene from the First World War when uh, planes are fighting each other, fighters, all are with two wings. We are having bi biplanes. And the pilots, you know, the, the planes used to be equipped with guns. So the pilot will aim at the opposing plane and then, you know, try to fire his gun and they'll climb over, then run, manipulate and fight and try to shoot each other down. Now, there are pilots, if you are able to shoot down five of your enemy planes, you will be called an ace pilot. That is how the grade is given to the pilot. If you shoot five planes down, you become an ace. And here is the greatest flying aces of all time. His name is Red Baron. He is a First World War German pilot. And he shot down, you know, how many? 80 planes. So he is one of the greatest pilots ever. First World War pilot, and unfortunately, he perished at the end of the First World War, around 1918 or so. Red Baron, his actual name is something else, but he is known as the Red Baron. Okay, So that was the fighting missions of the First World War, how we used to do. And then they invented the bombers, you know, uh, the fighters. Okay, we'll continue with the fighters. This plane, all of you are knowing. I'm sure many of you recognize. This is one of our mainstays of the Indian Air Force for 40 years. This is the MiG-21. MiG-21, and uh, all of you people are aware that even last year this was operating. In, uh, we had the uh, uh, Balakot airstrike and then fight with Pakistan, where Captain Abhinandan, Wing Commander Abhinandan, actually flew in a uh, MiG-21. So this is a Mach-2 fighter, means it can fly twice the speed of sound. 
This first stop went into survey somewhere in 1970. So last 50 years, this plane has been flying. Just imagine, aircraft always, once they enter into service, they'll continue in operation for decades because developing an aeroplane is very complex, very costly. It will take 15 to 20 years, more than a rocket vehicle it will take. It will take literally 20 years, two decades to make aeroplane fly. And then they will keep on upgrading. So this MiG-21, even today, it is flying in our Indian Air Force. So we have the MiG-21 here. And these are all uh, present day aircraft of Indian Air Force. You can see these planes here. They, are, uh, they have the Sukhoi Su-30, you have the MiG-29, then you have the Mirage, and you have the um, Rafale on the top left. Trademark Rafale, I'm sure you can manage, you can make it out. And this is the view from below. When you look at a uh, Rafale, you see how the planes have changed from the First World War. When I have shown you a few slides ago, how the pilots were fighting in the First World War, and today's flight you see, you see the bottom side of the Rafale is covered with rockets. Each one of those things, what you see, there are missiles. Either they'll be launching from air-to-air -air missile at another enemy aircraft, or they'll be launching at a, a stationary target on the ground, and so on and so forth. So, the plane actually is carrying so many missiles, so many missiles and guns and so on, and so many other electronic equipment. And these planes are also equipped with radars. So, nobody today will go face-to-face. The pilot will be trying to shoot on the next guy even at a distance of 5 kilometers or 10 kilometers because what you are try doing is tracking on a radar. You have sideway looking radar, you have downward looking radar, upward looking radar, whatever you name it. So your uh, plane is actually filled with very advanced equipment and then you are tracking the enemy pilot and then try to shoot him from as far away as possible. So that's a, actually a fighter plane. This is our own uh, Rafale plane which is now with the Indian Air Force. And so you saw the particular shape of this Rafael plane's wing. You know, this is known as what is known as a delta wing. It's a triangle shaped wing. And so depending on the application of the plane, you have entirely different wing forms. You see here, you find different, different shapes of the wings. You have on the top left, you have the straight wing. And then below that, you have the surf pack wing. And then you have the delta wing and tapered wing and variable geometry wing. So all these are made depending on the flight application. If you are flying at a low altitude, high altitude, high speed, low speed, and so on, you are going for different selections of wing forms, okay? So the Rafale, obviously, uh, being a very fast uh, um, fighter, it has a um, delta, okay? Now, during the Second World War, a series of uh, kind of... Uh, Bombers developed, known as the dive bombers. Okay, so it's actually, now you can imagine, for example, you people imagine yourself standing in the open space. No place to hide. Let's say you are near a seesaw and you have no place to hide. You are in the open air and a plane and you are, let's say, thousand people, so thousand soldiers are standing and a plane approaches from the top and they attack you. You have no place to hide. So during the Second World War, you know, the Germans used a bomber plane, a dive bomber plane called the Stuka. This is the Stuka. They used it with devastating effect. People were terrified of the Stuka. When the Stuka approaches, you run for your life. So all army formations were, you know, if you send a Stuka and already there's a collection of thousands of troops, they will run for their lives. So you can easily break it up. So this plane, the Stuka played a terrific role in um, the second world war one part of it and you can see a stuka coming in it comes in level flight and then since it has to dive actually it makes a rolling motion you can see towards the left uh, uh, sorry you can see that you know at the top left it is already rolled it is rolled 180 degree and then it is making the dive and doing the bombing here it is hitting a tank and just i want to show you a video of uh, a dive bombing operation from a film called Dunkirk. I'm sure some of you might have seen it. How it can introduce fear in your hearts, a dive bomber.
So the same Second World War, they started, you know, attacking ships. The ships were also attacked using this kind of uh, dive bombers, you see, uh, suicide bombers, especially the Japanese were doing it. Japanese did it. So I'll just love to show you a real footage where a dive bomber attacks a ship and sets it on fire. This is actually 1944. With the homeland in danger of invasion, the Japanese high command turns to a desperate new tactic. On the 25th of November, 1944, a lone Japanese bomber closes in on the USS Essex. Its pilot is part of a new force, the Special Attack Corps, Kamikaze. So during the closing stages of the Second World War, these uh, dive bombers played a havoc fight against big ships. If you have a ship and you know you have a dive bomber ready to sacrifice its life, the ship is a goner. You've seen it. So that's how they use dive bombers. Nowadays, actually, dive bombers are hardly there. I don't think there's any operational dive bombers. They are not in the strategic uh, consideration. What we have is actually bombers. Now you are all familiar with bombers. What a bomber does, a bomber's objective is obviously to carry bombs or heavy, you know, heavy equipment of that nature, bombs and explosives, take it to the enemy territory as far as possible and drop it, do precision bombing. You bomb, you know, you try to bomb the military targets, avoid the civilians, and uh, you return safely. So that's the idea behind the bomber. And uh, today, you know, is uh, if you, many of you will be, knowing that today is actually a sad day in world history. Today is August 6th. August 6th is uh, celebrated or uh, you know, every year commemorated as the World Hiroshima Day. As you all know, the first nuclear bomb in the world was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6th, that is today, 71 or 76 years before today. Uh, on August 6th of 1945, the Americans dropped the first atom bomb on Hiroshima. And the bomber used was this plane. It is uh, the B-29 Super Fortress, B-29 Super Fortress bomber, which has carried this bomb all the way into Japan. And then, you know, you, you would have seen, of course, the videos and photos of the horrific, horrible effects of a nuclear bomb. And uh, unfortunately, even today, we every country tries to, you know, build the nuclear defense, but uh, the effects of nuclear bombs are horrible. And we had Hiroshima and then followed a few days by Nagasaki. So uh, this, uh, so what is basically, I was only mentioning that these were carried to the location and dropped by a plane called the B-29 Super Fortress, Boeing 29, B-29 Super Fortress. And here we have a great plane. This is the B-52 bomber. B-52 bomber is operational today. It entered into service, believe it or not, in the year 1958. Today we are 70, probably 70 years afterwards, and still it is operational. American Air Force and many Air Forces, it's a strategic bomber. It can travel for very long distances, 12,000, 14,000 kilometers it will go. And then it carries heavy payload. It can carry bombs over around 30, 35 tons, and then it drops it there. And uh, you can see here the speciality of this plane, you know, it's a very wide angled, um, very wide wings, and each of these engine parts has two engines. Essentially, this is one of the very few planes, probably the only plane that I know, which has eight engines, two plus two, on the other side also two plus two. It's the B-52 bomber. Some of the pictures from the operation of a B-52 bomber, um, uh, you know, the bombs getting dropped and on right side bottom, a B-52 lifting off. It's a sight to see the B-52 take off. You can go and see videos of the B-52 lift off from the runway, how it is going. And then this is another operation I just wanted to mention to you people. This is air-to-air -air refueling. Many of you will be familiar with this air-to-air -air refueling. When a bomber has to travel very long distance, obviously you cannot carry all the fuel. Uh, you know, if you are going from, uh, to say, Trivandrum to Chennai, you can always refuel on the roadside stops. You have petrol bunks, but in the flight, what do you do? So you have 
online or you know in flight refueling it is known as air to air refueling so you have oil tankers like the vehicle in the front here is a tanker which carries fuel and the tanker and the bomber on the back side the b52 here actually comes up to this one and then they extend a hose from the first flight and the second fellow catches it and they transfer fuel it's actually one of the most risky operations obviously you can imagine they have to put each other in position they have to align the speeds the vehicle and then meticulously capture the hose and then transfer the fuel it's extremely risky and many times accidents and happen but all air forces now today we do it including indian air force also we do that so there is an operation called the air to air refueling okay now this bomber the tu160 blackjack is today the heaviest and most powerful bomber in the world it's a russian plane it's a russian plane the tu topolo 160 it's a very powerful plane travels at twice the sound of speed, speed of sound mark 2 we call it. travels two times the speed of sound and um, one of the few interesting things about it is what is known as a swing wing you see i was telling you different shapes of the wings during different flight regimes it's better to have different shapes of the wings you have straight wings you have sub wings you have delta wings so it helps you to reduce your uh, drag and so on and helps you to fly so there are some planes where the wing shape is changed during flight what do you call it as a swing wing aeroplane swing wing flight so this tu160 the tupelo is actually a swing wing aircraft you see here you see the different positions of the wings when it takes off the wings are straight and then it can sweep and then with a deep sweep so that is your tupelo tu160 you can see videos are available in the youtube you can see how it takes off and so it's really a marvelous plane traveling at twice the speed of sound and this is the you know another plane with the different wing shapes the same plane flying at different speeds with different wing shapes as i showed you on the bottom is at a low speed flight and you can see the wings are straight and then high speed and then very high speed so this is how the wing shapes change and then um, there are planes called stvol bar vtvol short or vertical take off and landing Now, many times you have seen, you know, you have aircraft carrier, which uh, it, uh, you have seen uh, the news yesterday, two days back, you have seen our own uh, INS Vikrant. INS Vikrant, India's first indigenous home-built uh, aircraft carrier has been launched for trials. So, it is, uh, you know, going around in the sea. And uh, so, these um, uh, aircraft carriers carry aircraft on top of it. And then these aircraft are actually launched from the ship. So, if you have actually a 1 km, 2 km, 3 km runway on the ground in an airport, you cannot afford that in a ship. So, you have short runways. So, you have to take off from the short runways. Many a time you have to lift off from the static position itself, like a helicopter and so on. So, these are known as short bar vertical takeoff and landing planes. Okay. So, here you have an aircraft carrier. You find around 100 planes are there. In fact, many of the aircraft carriers carry more than 100 flights. and uh, they will be launched one by one one by one they will be launched into operation suppose you know you want to launch it at some other country you will take this aircraft carrier close to that country's uh, shore and then you know this plane will lift off one by one and then go and then again come back and land it's a fantastic uh, pilot ship how uh, you know i was uh, fortunate to once climb there was one originally there was an irns vikrant in our indian navy it was a british built ship which we purchased and then we used it for about 30 40 years now it is decommissioned so i was fortunate to board that ship and go inside and um, the people there are certain legends about the pilots who used to fly from the ins vikrant the original i was told about one pilot who when he took off from the uh, runway on the top of the ship you know the plane actually fell down they could not climb it just fell right down and the ship is actually moving the ship is actually moving and this plane went right below the ship and the pilot being a pilot you know he is having so much control on his mind he did nothing he didn't try to eject or anything because otherwise he would have ejected over under the ship and hit the ship he waited for the ship to pass and then he ejected and came back safely so these are the legendary stuff that actually planes and pilots are made of so this is an aircraft carrier we have short take off landing aircraft and here we have a typical helicopter of the indian air force you lift off and helicopter has a top rotor blade and you will see also a tail blade a tail uh, on the left side you find the tail rotor so you have a rotor on the top and a rotor on the left okay so to counterbalance the rotation 
you can imagine what will happen if the tail rotor was not there the plane will swing back when the helicopter rotor swings in one direction the plane will react in the other direction so to counter that always you will have to have a long tail plane and then you will have a rotor on the tail okay and uh, this is another kind of a uh, short takeoff airline where you are actually um, swiveling swiveling or rather rotating the engine itself so the thrust plane becomes vertical straight away so you have many other aircraft which are uh, very good specifically designed for ships like the harrier jump jet and um, there are many planes you can check it up so this is another type of aircraft what we have and then of course the commonest form of aircraft what we have the transport planes now transport you know i was uh, very um, interested to read recently that uh, tata jrd tata was the first person who piloted an air india plane that time it was known as the tata airlines in 1932 100 years almost before today he flew from bombay to rawalpindi or somewhere like that so this was the plane which was used it's a single engine uh, propeller plane it's uh, made by a company called d haviland single seater and carried luggage so from that plane, today we have a variety of big transport planes. You know, on the top left, you have Boeing 737. On the top right, you have a Boeing 747, known as the Jumbo. And then on the bottom left, you have what is known as a Lockheed TriStar. You can see a Lockheed TriStar has a different engine configuration. Do you notice that? Please look at the engines of these planes. On the top left, Boeing 737 has two engines. On one wing, one engine. On the right side top, Boeing 747, which is a much heavier plane, you find, you find uh, two engines on each side. So it's a four-engine jet. And on the Lockheed TriStar on the left side bottom, you find one engine on the tail plane. It's a TriStar, three engines. So two engines, one under each wing and one over the tail plane. So that's uh, another positioning of the engine. And on the right side, you have the biggest aeroplane today, the Airbus A380, Airbus 380 can carry about 570 passengers so like a floating city you can call it 570 passengers it's a massive thing it has a takeoff weight of almost 550 tons and so on it's a huge airplane today it is the heaviest and the biggest passenger plane in operation so these are transport planes and then we come to a magnificent plane the concord many of you would have heard about concord it is a only supersonic plane, the, one of the two supersonic planes which have operated ever, passenger transport planes. There is a competitor, which is a Russian plane, Tu-144. And um, so here we have this uh, magnificent bird, which uh, nothing but the Concorde. It was in operation for about uh, around 30, 40 years, and it was decommissioned somewhere early, early 2003 or four. I think around 2003 was the last flight of the um, Concorde. Concorde, you know, was uh, flying at twice the speed of sound, Mark II, 2.05 cruise. So, when uh, this plane flies over the countries, it will create sonic booms. Many of you who are living in cities would have heard sonic booms. They are nothing but shockwaves. You know, when an aeroplane breaks the speed of sound, there is something called a shockwaves, and the shockwaves are shed to the ground, and that you hear it as this explosive noises. So the Concorde is a big plane and when it is taking off and landing, it used to create huge shocks. So many countries will not allow Concorde to land in their soil, including we never allowed it. I think in once or twice it has come and landed in Bombay, but otherwise India did not permit Concorde landings. So it used to regularly operate between USA and Europe and so on. So I would like to just show you one magnificent takeoff video of a Concorde. So you get the power and the beauty of the flight of a Concorde. Yeah, she's rocking. There's the smoke. enjoy the beauty of that Concorde's takeoff. It's a tremendous sight to see the uh, Concorde takeoff. And seriously, as uh, you can imagine, you know, being uh, it flies at, as I told you, two times the speed of sound, it 
guzzles fuel, consumes fuel like anything. So the ticket of Concorde itself was very costly and you know, only the richest class people will fly in the Concorde. And um, uh, Concorde, you know, we, uh, they had an unfortunate accident also by the year it was 2000 and so it was decommissioned. Now recently I was reading some other companies planning to come out with uh, um, another supersonic transport in maybe around 10, 20 years. And then presently for the last 20 years there has been no supersonic transport plane after the Concorde. Okay. Now, I wanted to expose you to another class of planes called spy planes. Now we have seen fighters, we have seen bombers, we have seen transport planes which carry people from place to place and then I want you to see what is known as a spy plane. So this is a beautiful picture of one of the uh, longest serving spy planes. This is the U-2, U-2, U, U for under, U-2. This is one of the, uh, this again entered service around somewhere around 1956 or 58. And this flying for the last 70 years. Today also it's being operational. It is operational even today. And um, this flies at very high altitudes. It flies around, you know, service ceiling around 90,000 feet. Means close to 30 kilometers it can go. It's really high altitude flight. And uh, so why, why it is built like this? Because in the 1950s or 60s, there were, nobody could reach anywhere near this plane. Suppose you are flying over an enemy country and then, you know, trying to take photos and all that, nobody can reach you to shoot you down. And so they will fly over all over the other countries, take void, you know, a huge amount of photographs and then return to base or drop, uh, drop the films or transmit down. So this plane is still operational today. It is known as the U-2, uh, one of the most famous uh, spy planes. And this plane, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. This is known as uh, the SR-71, the Blackbird. A code name Blackbird, and uh, this is supposed to be the fastest uh, plane available, SR-71. You can see the engine on the left side, the turbojet engine on the left side, and on the right side, you can see an engine undergoing ground testing. And on the top left, you see the um, SR-71 in a cruise mode, and on the right side, you find it accelerating. Do you see the flame coming out from the engine? It's using its afterburner. Many of these engines use what is known as an afterburner to give sudden power increase. So here you see the SR-71 accelerating away um, using its afterburner. So, so it's a beautiful plane to watch and it's the fastest plane uh, presently available. It flies at uh, more than three times the speed of sound, 3.4 times it is climbed actually. So it is uh, still operational, even though they claim that we are decommissioning that, it is still flying. Even today it is operational, only in the US Air Force, as far as I know. They are not given it to anybody. And here is another great plane, MiG-25. MiG-25 known as the Foxbat. I'm sure, you know, uh, many of you will be familiar with the MiG-25, a legendary plane, which again, we had it in our Indian Air Force. We operated it till around 2004 or 2005. Now it is decommissioned. And it's a, another great plane, one of the greatest planes. It flies with extreme speed. It uh, Mach 3 plus again. This is again Mach 3.3 .3 or 3. Point, uh, so plus. And it is, uh, even today, it is holding many of the flight records in the world for the fastest climbing plane, for the plane reaching the highest altitude at the shortest time. And so many records it is today also holding. And uh, this particular plane, you know, when it was operating in the Indian Air Force, it has uh, gone to. Uh, on many uh, spying missions over Pakistan and so many neighboring countries. And never it has been shot down. It is so fast and it flies so high. So it is one of the legendary uh, uh, spy planes and it's also used in different roles like interceptor and so on. It's not only a spy plane. Where the other two I showed you was only a spy plane. This is having multi roles. Like it can carry bombs, it can you know attack other planes and so on. It's a really one of the greatest planes ever made. It was operational for about 30, 40 years and then decommissioned in the year 2004 or five. And then of course the simple cargo planes which carry luggage, I don't have to tell you this one, but there is also very interesting a few things I'd like to just bring for your uh, attention. Here you have known as the, this is the world's heaviest cargo plane. It is a Russian plane called AN-225, Mergia, 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 AN-225. You can see three engines on each side. You know, you know, it's a takeoff weight, 640 tons. It can lift off with a weight of 640 tons. Uh, just imagine, it means 6,40,000 kilograms. If you're not familiar with tons, 
It is 6,40,000 kilograms is the liftoff weight of this massive, powerful plane. So that is the AN-225 for you. And many of you would have seen this um, another one, Airbus uh, cargo plane called Beluga, uh, which is actually what's up and other places you find many times that this is the heaviest plane, but it's not true. The heaviest plane is actually AN-225, what you've seen previously. And, uh, but this is having a peculiar shape. You see the shape of this particular plane, cargo shape, because on the bottom you see it is loading. It is made for loading certain specific items. You find huge cargo being loaded on the right side bottom picture. The beluga has opened its mouth and it's actually taking in um, the luggage. So that's a beluga for you. And this is another plane. You, I'm sure you might be recognizing the one on the top. That is nothing but the space shuttle. And the one on the bottom is nothing but a Boeing 747. Uh, so 747, which has been operational for again about 60 years or 70 years, that is also used for carrying the shuttle from place to place, to the launch pad. For example, it will be serviced, the space shuttle will be serviced somewhere. It will be mounted on top of this Boeing 747, and the 747 will actually carry it from one point to the other point. Okay, so, so these are the kind of cargo planes or carrier planes, and there are so many other planes like uh, troop transport planes and so on. We will not go into the detail because of lack of time. And there are planes which use rockets for flying, rocket planes. And uh, all of you have seen this plane about one month back, right? We had a plane with a much publicized flight, a Virgin Galactic plane flying to the edge of space for tourists. And uh, you found the founder of this um, company himself flying it, an Indian girl was also there. And so this plane actually uses rocket power. You can see that rockets firing, you can, you can see the rocket exhaust uh, you know, um, very clearly there. It's what is known as using a um, hybrid propellant uh, rocket engine. And uh, this is a close-up view of the plane. It flies, it takes off or flies off into the space like a rocket and then comes and lands like an ordinary airplane. It's a close-up of that one. And here you see it is being carried in a carrier plane. So you see aircraft can be made into any shape. You see this particular airplane, which is carrying the Virgin module in the middle. So this has two fuselages. It's almost like two independent planes, but it's a single plane with the two engines on the left or two engines on the right. On the middle, you are hanging this plane or, you know, the space plane. And uh, this takes off, the whole thing takes off from the ground, goes to a height of around 10, 12 kilometers. And then it will drop the one in the middle. The space plane, rocket plane will be dropped from that altitude and then it will ignite its rocket engine and then go towards uh, space. So that is how some of these planes operate. And uh, this was the very first rocket plane, 1947. It is known as the Bell One. And the pilot is one of the most famous people, Chuck Yeager. He's the man who flew past Mach number one for the first time, 1947. They flew faster than the speed of sound. The first time sound speed was broken. So that is, as you all know, sound speed is around 330 meters per second. So this flies faster than this. So this was the very first flight, 1947. It is known as the Bell 1, X1. And then here you have another greatest plane, X15. The X15 is the original space plane. X15 still holds all the records. You know, it flew in the 1960s. The X15 was carried, like the Virgin plane, what I was showing you, this X15 is carried to around 20 kilometers in a B-52. The bomber, whatever you've seen, B-52 bomber carries this to a height of around 12 kilometers. You see that on the bottom, you know, it's hanging. You can see the X-15 hanging on the other side of this bomber. And at 12 kilometers on the right side bottom, you can see it has just dropped it, released that. And then the rocket engine ignites. And then it flies to, uh, you know, space. It's one of the greatest planes ever. Today, it holds the all-time uh, speed record, max 6.72, means 6.7 times faster than the speed of sound. So, Today also it is unmatched, this plane. And uh, here you find one of the greatest people who was a pilot of the X-15. I think many of you will recognize him. He is nobody but Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, who was an X-15 pilot. You can see him standing happily here and smiling. He has flown many sorties in this X-15 and you know at hypersonic speeds, max six plus is tremendous, unbelievable speeds. We call it hypersonic. And you see him after landing here, um, standing on this plane. 
and then you know uh, there are a class of planes we are uh, i'll try to keep it shorter and we have a class of planes called stealth planes as i was telling you people uh, the um, stealth planes are again when you have you know uh, spy planes for example and you are going and spying in other countries or if you are going and actually bombing other countries you want to hide yourself so stealth not, means nothing but secrecy so how does enemy country detect you if you fly over their country by using radar so stealth plane becomes invisible to radar that is the whole principle of a stealth plane so you see the shape of a stealth plane this is the f117 a so stealth plane it is literally invisible to radar how that is achieved you people can please read it you know it is by scattering the radar partly it will absorb the radar it has high specialized coatings and composite material which will absorb much of the radar and not allow it to go and then you see the sharp angles can you imagine such a thing flies actually i have seen pilots when they were first shown this plane they said we cannot fly this thing it cannot fly there is a the shape of that plane it's all angles sharp angles you know you can see edges sharp angles and so on but it flies beautifully and it is invisible to radar people say it is a cross section radar cross section of a bird with enders any minimum territory it can be having a maximum cross section radar of that of a bird it's so stealthy okay and you here you see an f6 this is a side view again it looks a very strange view and here it's dropping it's on a bombing run somewhere as f117 a and then you have the latest b2 bomber it's again a stealth plane it's actually a flying wing you see around um, 70 80 years ago they had the concept of a flying wing i think in the future also we will go back to flying wings uh, but this is essentially a flying wing you can see it looks mysterious like a flying wing and you know with the, almost like a bat or i don't know how to call this one it looks uh, by its own way it looks it's a basically a flying wing but it's literally invisible it's one of the top most stealth planes of today and then we go to it's a question which is debated hotly on internet which is the fastest plane everybody is interested in knowing which is the fastest plane we already seen them but i just highlight in a separate slide you have the you have the advocates of the sr71 who say sr71 is the fastest and we have advocates of the mig25 foxbat who say that it's the fastest but all i can say is they are separated by very little gap the official claims by the sr71 people they say we can go 3.4 times faster than the speed of sound and the x50 the mig25 has definitely flown 3.3 times the speed of sound and maybe they are equally balanced so, so these are the two fastest planes and uh, ever in history there have been of course we are not considering the rocket plane if you consider the rocket plane obviously that becomes the fastest but then here we are talking about an actual aeroplane we are not talking about a rocket plane so these are the fastest plane and then um, one more topic which is you know known to all of you drones in many of you i'm sure have operated drones for either for photography or for hobby and all that so technically these drones are known as uavs unmanned aerial vehicle that's the way they are known as uav and this is the biggest um, you know drone which is flying now it's from the us air force it's known as the rq4 rq4 global hawk actually it is um, it was proposed rather as a replacement for the u2 i showed you a spy plane called u2 which carries actually pilots so this is pilotless it's an um, unmanned aerial vehicle it can also fly very long distances cover huge areas you see there on the road i am showing on the bottom it can fly for 32 hours at a stretch it can photograph around 1 lakh square kilometer in one flight 1 lakh square kilometer it's a turbine engine and flies very high 60000 feet and so on so this is presently the most powerful and long traveled uav unmanned aerial vehicle which is used mainly for reconnaissance and then this is the israeli heron which indian air force has got i think we are now right now got it are going to get it it's a propeller um, uh, propeller driven drone again it's again an uav and uh, it can stay afloat for 50 hours 50 hours it can fly and then you know spy over the other countries and um, this is another view of the uh, the same heron and uh, i want to show you a wonderful beautiful plane this is uh, again it is not the safair what is the difference this is also uav it's also an unmanned vehicle you can't even make out there's a plane there right you, can you make out it's a 
It's a fantastic plane. You see the design of that with a very long wingspan. The peculiarity is it is solar powered. Totally powered by solar. There are no engines otherwise. It's a, two propellers are driven by solar power, no fuel. And it can remain airborne. The record is with the 26 days. It is flown and then remained airborne for 26 days before next landing. So, you know, you can't see it. First of all, you can't see it. It can fly anywhere it wants. It requires no fuel, no servicing, nothing, no pilot danger. And it can take as much data it wants. It can carry any equipment. So this is one of the uh, presently operations with the French people. Actually, Airbus people developed this one. It's known as the Zephyr. But I was really uh, amazed at the beauty of this plane, how it is there. You know, it's like a thin line. You can't make out the body of the plane. It's so wonderful. So that is what is a drone. And then, of course, the simple drones, which you people, many of you would have flown, which in wedding functions and, you know, um, uh, now everywhere without drones, you cannot live. Suppose there's a disaster, you send a drone. If you want to photograph a crowd, you would send a drone. You want to manage a crowd, you send a drone. You want a wedding, you want to you use a drone. So these drones usually have four propellers. Unlike the other planes, which are one or two, you know, typically be what, from operational reasons, what they concluded having four gives you the best balance, the best way for it to move, maneuverability, and so on. So these are all the last four or five planes which I have shown to you. This is also near craft only. These are all known as UAVs or unmanned aerial vehicles. Basically, you can call them drones. Probably one of these days you can buy these and operate these drones. Now they are so commonly used. And then one of the future requirements, which uh, surely those of you who enter this field of aer uh, uh, aircraft, because you now we are very much bothered about pollution. You know, we are uh, all of you are knowing about global warming, climate change, and so on. Aircraft industry is also contributing about 5% of the gases which are generated, greenhouse gases, 5% of this is generated by the aviation industry. So there's an effort actually to uh, remove fossil fuel. We want to remove fossil fuel so that pollution from the aircraft industry can be removed. And for that, of course, you have what is known as solar planes. This uh, Many of you will know this plane. This is known as a solar impulse. On the top, you find this elegant and beautiful plane. On the top, you find completely solar cells, which actually generate electricity and which are actually stored in big capacitor banks. And then they, night also, they power the engines. You can see the propellers on the front and uh, um, the solar power is used. And the night also, they fly. Day and night makes no difference to it. It flies and then because it stores the power and then uses it in the night and then flies well over the clouds. And um, they made a circumnavigation of the Earth. You will remember that around the five, six years back, uh, this particular plane came and traversed India also. They came all over the world and then returned back in about a month or so. So it's a beautiful plane called Solar Impulse. And then there are certain planes which are now under development, which use hydrogen fuel. Hydrogen fuel, it's very difficult, but uh, uh, this is the Boeing H-4, what you call the Boeing H-4. It's an experimental aircraft which is uh, uh, used uh, using hydrogen as a fuel, and sometimes they use hydrogen as a fuel cell for powering. But this we recur in the future, because in the future, obviously, we cannot continue using fossil fuel. We cannot use. So we need to find alternatives to fly our aircraft, and uh, maybe solar power, and then this hydrogen power, and so on. We'll have to work more on that one. And finally, I come to the final topic of the day. It is the hypersonic planes, the planes of the future, because we always want to fly faster and we want to reduce travel time. Now, you can see that between two continents or between two countries, we are always attempting to reduce the travel time. We have cut it down by hours. Today, maybe some from here to USA also, you take 10 hours, 12 hours, 14 hours, and so on. But if you can fly much faster, Suppose you can go hypersonic space. Hypersonic typically we mean Mach number five, meaning you fly five times the speed of sound. So if you can go at Mach number five and so on, you, know, you can cut down the travel times like anything. So people are always working towards developing hypersonic planes. And uh, so this is one of the experimental planes it's known as the NASA X-43. X-43 travels at around uh, Mach six. Mach 6, it flies uh, six times the speed of sound. It's an experimental aircraft. Nothing has become operational so far. And uh, ISRO also, um, ISRO also has carried out, you know, uh, our own um, uh, studies on this uh, kind of a vehicle. 
And the main difference here is actually the combustion. We will not go into the details, but the combustion in, say, this engine takes place in supersonic condition. The combustion itself takes place under high velocities, more than the speed of sound. You know, I have shown you in the jet engine schematic earlier, and uh, the fuel is injected and air is taken in, and then it combusts, actually. Here, the whole phenomena, the air is not slowed down. It is slowed down only limited way. It's uh, slowed down to still higher than the speed of sound and then combustion. So the net result is you are able to fly at um, enormous speeds, at uh, hypersonic speeds. So these are all future developments. Probably your generation, you people, when you get a chance and if you choose this field, you will be working on this kind of uh, uh, you know, subjects you know, using lack of you know, alternate energy planes and then hypersonic planes and so on. So there are a number of challenges. I'm not listing out the challenges for you people here. There are especially a number of challenges facing you in the field of aircrafts, reduce pollution, they reduce sound, increase the speed, and uh, everything like, you know, uh, pollution avoid, etc., etc. Maybe in future times when you get time, see people, those of you who enter this field can work on these topics. So with this figure, I come to this uh, conclusion of my talk. So before I close off, let me tell a few things. Once again, I say that I'm extremely thankful for getting this opportunity for interacting with such a, a team of youngsters. And uh, I take the opportunity to wish all of you a very successful, bright future. And I, in whatever career you people decide to pursue, I hope some of you will enter into the care in the area of uh, aeronautics. And I also wish the JMM Study Center a great future. They are doing a wonderful job. Please continue to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah. Question, question, answer session. Dr. Deepthi will guide you through. The thank question. you, sir. Yeah, I'm available. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for the informative talk. Uh, there are a few questions in the chat box and slido.com. I'll read out one by one. The first question Recently, Boom Aerospace has launched their own supersonic aircraft. Will that aircraft be permitted in India? Okay, now um, to tell you the truth, they have actually proposed a plan for an airplane. This plane may come after 10 or 20 years. Nobody has any clear idea. They want to make an aircraft and then fly a supersonic plane and uh, hopefully it will end up service. If at all it is pursued to that level and uh, maybe in 15, 20 years they will come out with the airplane and yes, maybe depending on the size and the kind of disturbance it creates, perhaps it will be permitted. I hope so. I hope so. But it is still on the drawing boards. It's waiting for funding and it's going to take a long time, maybe around 20 years. Yes, please. Next one. Yes, yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, the next question. What are the precautions taken if an air aircraft overrun the runway? Well, you'll be in trouble. <laughs> whatever, whatever precaution you take, you, know, you saw that last year in Kodi Code, what happened, you know? <laughs> I think um, uh, nothing much can be done. Unfortunately, nothing much can be done. And I told you the interesting case where a pilot ran off uh, INS Vikrant, where he managed to survive because he kept his cool and then waited for the airplane, I mean, the ship to pass over him and then ejected. So he survived. But if you are overshooting a runway, you know, most of the runways, especially in cities, they have boundary walls. And uh, Kodi Kodi is separate because it's like, a, what do you call a table, a table kind of a runway. So you fall down and ditch. Otherwise, you will end up ramming into either, you know, a boundary wall or uh, some kind of a ramp or, you know, marshy place and so on. So, it's not, it's to be avoided. We have to take all efforts. And sometimes when they are about to overshoot, they will try to lift off again. If runway length is available and, you know, the speed is not come down so much, many pilots at occasions will try to take off again and then come back for another attempt. So, that's it. So, try not to um, do that. Next one, please. Next. Uh, Deepthi, you are there. Hello. Uh, yeah, yeah, she, yeah, she, uh, the, there is a power shutdown at her place. Oh. So, so you can read from. Or if you want any help, you can 
ask Rachel to help you. Yeah. Rachel is yeah. Mrs. Uh, Rachel, you are there? Yeah. I think I will, uh, till Deepthi comes back, I will try to read from the... Yeah. Um, still have operational hypersonic cruise missiles. Hypersonic cruise missiles are there. Somebody is asking why we can't have hypersonic cruise missiles. Um, okay, I think I have to go from the bottom perhaps. I don't know how to go. There is a very interesting question. Please One person me. has asked, ah. which is more dangerous, a plane hitting a bird or a bird hitting a plane? Both are <laughs> <around. laughs> this, is, this is like the you know, mechanism of generating lift. Whether you fly through the still air or the air flows past you. It's both are one and the same. So both are equally dangerous. <laughs> A uh, plane, uh, you know, a bird entering a plane, you know, can destroy and damage the flight. It will be end of the flight. So it's an extremely dangerous situation. That's why, you know, try to people try to clear the airport surroundings. They try to, you know, maintain it bird free, but still we have bird hits. Still we have bird hits. Okay. Essentially what it does, you know, what it enters a jet engine, actually, it, you know, damages the blades. Once a blade breaks, you know, it's gone. It will enter into the engine and then you have catastrophe. So... Uh, it's uh, always preferable we should try uh, to clear the airport and its surroundings of uh, dirt which can attract birds like waste uh, material and you know um, uh, what do you call this kind of meat waste and so on so it's uh, we must always try to avoid this there is another sir, question here, sir i am back okay yes, sir, i am back Carry on. Carry on. Okay. okay thank Sorry, you sir. Mm. Okay, sir. Uh, sir the next question is from adway biju okay uh, uh, sir, uh, can we achieve a spaceship which can get to the speed of light? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think uh, presently we have, we are not even reaching, you know, perhaps we are now in 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 or something of uh, speed of light. Eh? Because, you know, the speed of light, as you know, is typically roughly around 3 lakh, 3 lakh kilometer per second. And we are now, so far I've been talking about hypersonic planes, which is around, you know, um, uh, five times the speed of sound, six times. So, 6 into 330, 6 into 330, 1800 meter per second and so on. So, it's nowhere. We are in a negligible fraction of the speed of sound. Presently, we do not have any propulsion means which will take you anywhere near the speed of uh, light. No. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Sunny Abraham Madhu. Sir, can Rafael and other fighter jets can be artificial intelligent, intelligent like the drones? Yeah, perhaps you can do that, you know, perhaps you can do that, um, perhaps you can do that, but then, you know, there are different classes, either you have a pilot or you don't have a pilot. The greatest advantage of a human being there, you know, he takes real-time decisions and the human presence uh, matters all the time, whereas a drone will be programmed, artificial intelligence or whatever you call it, it's all pre-programmed and it will react in a planned or a programmed way, whereas a pilot sitting there reacts as per the situation. That makes the, all the difference in a, you know, uh, in a situation. When you have to be a fast reflex and in a lightning speed decision-making situation, the presence of a trained and experienced pilot makes all the difference. So I don't think uh, a drone can ever replace a pilot. But then uh, if uh, a pilot's uh, life can be definitely saved on occasions by like, you know, in a spy plane or bombers and so on, you can use, um, you know, artificial-based drones. Yes. Yes, sir. Abhimanyu Anand want to know, uh, uh, can you give some example of technologies which arise, arise in military? Pardon me? Can you please repeat that question? Yes, sir. Some examples of technologies which hmm. arise in the military. Which military. are... The which has come out of the military program. Every, much of that, almost everything, almost every technology in the aircraft industry, all these fighter planes are, you know, we, defense actually consumes the whole aircraft industry. Uh, the passenger transport and so on, cargo planes, etc. are one segment, whereas the big business segment is, you know, uh, these defense planes. So you can see one of the, each one of these planes will cost you thousands of crores. Each a plane like this, you know, Rafael cost you around 1,500 crores, I think, one plane. So you can imagine the kind of industry and the amount of investment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All developments, all R and D will be there in how to improve the performance of these military planes. So the spin-offs actually go into civilians at times, but major R and D everything takes place parallelly in military industry also. 
So the defense planes, all these planes like the spy planes, fighters, bombers, etc., etc., a lot of them are actually for defense. So huge amount of development takes place in the defense area. There was a very uh, interesting question. What happens to the aircraft when it reaches the Bermuda Triangle? I saw it somewhere. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Now, I think my, I can understand from you people that you are all very good readers. I am very sure that, you know, you would have read books about Bermuda Triangle. And um, I also recall reading some books on the Bermuda Triangle, which is a mysterious, you know, triangle. And where ships disappear, where planes disappear and so on. Unfortunately, people have tried to analyze um, with the data, you know, thorough analysis does not indicate the existence of even a Bermuda Triangle. So unfortunately, we have to, you know, um, uh, we have to conclude that um, maybe nothing much happens at Bermuda Triangle. It's all hype. For us. Uh, did they carry on? I just. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> sir uh, next question: Can a plane's speed can be increased by adding more engine? Um, you can to some extent. Yes, you can to extent. Yes, you see, in an aeroplane, it's all a compromise. When you design an aeroplane, it's 100% compromise. You have to give something and take something. Okay. Now, if you then add, add an engine to increase the thrust, actually, obviously, the weight of the plane goes up, the drag of the plane goes up, everything goes up. So, perhaps the given engine itself, you reduce. So, in an aircraft industry, like the space industry, we always try to minimize weight. Minimize weight, minimize drag. These are the two mantras which you live by. So, you know, you would like to increase the power of the engine, definitely. You give an engine, you try to increase the power rather than add another engine. And meanwhile, try to reduce the weight of the aeroplane and reduce the drag of the aeroplane. So that's what would be the better solution, rather than go on blindly adding more and more engines. Because each engine is actually adding huge amount of weight to the plane. And, you know, power plant, and then the uh, engine has a good amount of drag and so on and so forth. So it will be better if you increase the capability of the existing engine and then reduce the drag of the plane. Yes, sir. So, Daniel Matthew is asking, what fuel source, in your opinion, has the most potential in the future for aircraft travel? Fuel source. Yes. Yeah, fuel source, as I was telling you, know, the aircraft industry presently generates about 5% of the um, greenhouse gases. So, uh, and uh, unfortunately, now this, or fortunately, whatever it is, this COVID has actually slowed down the aviation industry like anything. But before the COVID came, aviation industry was supposed to grow at, by leaps and bounds. A huge amount of growth was projected. And so people were concerned about, um, you know, these uh, gases, uh, greenhouse gases and so on. That's why we had to definitely, no other choice but to go for alternate fuel. Either use solar power or use uh, some electric power or use hydrogen as a uh, fuel and so on. And you would have seen that even, you know, many of you will be knowing our uh, Greater Thunberg. Many of you know, I'm sure that uh, most of you know the climate activist, Swedish a girl, who refuses to fly because, uh, you know, she has she traveled all the way from Europe to USA by ship or by a boat or whatever it is, because she was against air pollution caused by the uh, aircraft industry. So definitely we have to go for alternate fuel and probably hydrogen-based fuel and solar energy and so on. And people will find out, even uh, other options, they will find out, yes. Excellent, please. Yes, sir. The next question is from Navaneet Krishna. Yeah. Uh, what's your opinion on converting old aircraft into drones that can be piloted from somewhere else? No, I don't have too much opinion about that. Uh, I don't think it's a too good an, um, an idea. Because as I told you, the human presence actually makes an entire difference. A pilot you know, flying a mission is entirely different from a pre-programmed drone flying over a place. A pilot can take on-the-spot decisions and react instantaneously. They are trained for that. It's an entirely different picture. I would very much like to have the pilot there, definitely. I don't want a situation where the pilot is no more there and you leave it all to artificial intelligence and ground control. No. Thank you, sir. And the next question is from Shreya Nayar. Uh, from what type of an aircraft do we use to skydive from? Pardon me? Is there any skydive? What type of aircraft we are using for skydive? Skydiving, sky diving, you can go in a you know, reasonable speed, you know, like any transport plane. Uh, any, mostly they use the ordinary kind of a transport plane. Transport plane, which is 
flying at um, subsonic speeds means lower than the speed of sound reasonable speed and reasonable height you should be able to fly at a good height and also at a slow and steady speed and hold it steady when you open the door and the people jump out there so you can use ordinary planes for that no issue yes sir so do you actually believe in unidentified flying object ufo ah oh, that's a good one that's also yes. that's the most incredible flying mission of all <laughs> interestingly interestingly let me share a very interesting fact with you this ufos are you know uh, mostly reported from usa okay now one very interesting fact i came across recently almost all sightings are reported on friday evenings please note that it's on friday evenings when these chaps go on drinking sprees it is on friday evenings most of these people you know drink and then go for a walk and then they report ufos so um, almost um, i think 90% of ufos are reported from usa and on friday evenings so i think the question is answered for you by this fact itself and uh, i came across a number of uh, cases where you know they 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 analyze the footage of you know people who took the films of ufos in one particular incident i remember it was finally found to be a insect walking on the lens of the camera they said it's a you know ufo entering into the earth so i think um, uh, even though even though let me take one more second to tell that uh, i think the first lecture of this series you know dr anand narayan was telling you about life elsewhere set is such for extraterrestrial intelligence and so on so all facts scientifically you cannot rule out extraterrestrial intelligence definitely we cannot rule it out definitely we can't rule out the fact also the that aliens have landed and left also so that also we have no idea but whatever the sightings we have so far of ufos are unreliable to put it in a mild fashion so i wouldn't like to comment on that i don't think that uh, we have seen any human has seen any ufo so far but aliens might have come and gone i have no idea i wouldn't like to comment on that so that's it there was one question in between on spacex yes sir spaceship any any information on that you have somebody else has I forgot the name of the person okay was. i think you know from what i i'm not extremely aware of the finer aspects but from what i know spacex is actually contributing or rather focusing on um, launches rather than you know space tourism whereas the companies like blue origin and virgin galactic etc they are focusing more on tourism as a money making kind of a thing So even today's paper, I was reading that one ticket on uh, Virgin Galactic is going to cost you three crores or something, or three crores or thirty crores. I don't know. After some time, it will come down to three crores. Today, it may be thirty crores plus. So they are focusing on you know uh, space tourism, whereas SpaceX is actually providing launch services. In fact, now NASA is using SpaceX launches to go to the International Space Station, and they have plans for you know big big launches which will take uh, you know go take you to Mars and so on. so they are i think focusing on different segments of the space industry whereas uh, I, that's the thing that's the thing so i think spacex is more focused on big business of launch vehicles rather than on this um, thank you carry on dr deepthi yes sir uh, how much weight a jet can take how much weight yes it can take any weight you know as i was telling you i was showing you a picture of that russian uh, mrgya an 225 it has a lifting capability it takes off at a weight of 640 tons you know the take off weight of the mrigya is 640 tons if you put it in kilograms 6 lakh 40000 kilograms huge weight and it has a payload so what is the payload in this because the weight to lift off weight includes the basic weight of the aeroplane it includes the weight of the fuel it includes the weight of the people and so on so the payload essentially can be as high as 250 to 270 tons that is 250000 kilograms massive payload that is the as of now the record is actually with the russian an225 take off weight maximum take off weight of 640 tons and the payload weight of around 250 to 270 tons yes sir uh, the next question is from keshta uh, trains like hyperloop and maglev are in development how could this affect on airline industry okay that's nice actually uh, perhaps in the long term it will definitely have an in, um, impact because see as you know uh, so far the uh, main airlines are operating between big cities 
say like uh, say um, say Trivandrum to Chennai or Trivandrum to Bombay and so on. So there is a plan to have corollary, you know, smaller airlines operating between smaller cities. For example, Trivandrum and say Ernakulam, Ernakulam to maybe like this airlines are dedicated. They will be using smaller planes, uh, propeller planes, turboprops, etc., which will be operating in the short ranges. And uh, maybe this will be uh, no more in need if you go for very high speed trains between these places, because the train can carry many more passengers. And if you have hyperloop or if you have levitation or whatever it is between say Trivandrum and uh, Ernagulam and cut the travel time by one fourth, um, uh, I think that will be definitely preferred rather than going by air between a short distance like say Trivandrum and Ernagulam, because uh, you have to board, you have to take off, you have to land, clear this thing, that thing, all those things. The overall travel time will be much shorter, perhaps, if you use uh, one of these uh, advanced, um, you know, means of locomotion like hyperloop or levitation and so on. So, so it will have some impact. Yes, please yes. go ahead. Next one. Please. Yes, sir. Next question is from Jaswin. Why are phone? Uh, we are requested to switch off our phone while traveling on plane. Well, it's, you know, it's all electromagnetic radiation. Everything is. If you are inside a hospital, also they'll advise you not to switch on the. Uh, I mean, to switch off your uh, communication because you'll be interfering with some signals. You see, aircraft uh, communication always works on certain frequencies. All the time, there will be communication between the plane and the ground and so on, 24 hours, full time. And there will be at different frequencies and so on. So I don't think we should have any kind of a thing which is uh, going to interfere with that communication. If there is any means of interference with that communication, it should be avoided. In fact, I always feel people should be forced to switch on their switch off their mobiles. I find that when you go on a flight many times, even though repeatedly they want that you please switch off the mobiles, people continue to use them. So I feel it's very sad, uh, very sad that you know people cannot follow such a simple discipline. Um, it should be switched off when they say, if it is, if they really say, maybe some of that communication may be proof. It may be uh, what you call interference proof, in which case you are allowed to use that. In that case, no problem. Otherwise, we should switch off. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Aaron Kurvila. What was the first use of Antonov 225? Well, Antonov 225 is actually basically a cargo plane. It has been carrying very, very heavy cargoes. And if you people recall, I showed you one flight, you know, one uh, slide where a uh, Boeing 747 was carrying a space shuttle. I hope you people remember. I had a slide where the uh, Boeing 747 was carrying a space shuttle from one place to another. Similarly, the Russians had a space shuttle. The Russians, the Soviet Union had a space shuttle called the Buran. Buran, which, uh, uh, which was a huge, massive thing. And that was carried by the AN-225. In fact, the AN-225, one of the primary uses for which they made the AN-225 was to carry this Buran. Unfortunately, by the time the Soviet Union broke up, you know, the Buran program, etc., got cancelled. And though the AN-225 actually carries other um, cargo also. Yes, sir. Uh, the next question, which type of wing plane uh, is most used in Air Force? Which type of wing planes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I showed you, you know, the Rafale swing, for example. I showed you the Rafale swing, which is known as a delta wing. And you see the MiG-25 or the any of them. All of them, high-speed planes will have delta wings. So all planes which are at supersonic speed, they will have delta wings. So it is the delta wing, which is actually the most commonly used wing form in the uh, plan form, wing plan form in the um, military planes. The very old days, very old days, I showed you, like I showed you in the case of the Red Baron and so on, when the 1914s, they used to have the low speed fly, flying planes, they used to be straight wings. Because that's very mm -hmm. heavy. Anna, then why, Amma, is you? Well, one question was, yeah. why the black, black box survives in the airplane? During the airplane crash. Okay, okay, okay. No, that is because you see, you, you need to have uh, many times when these things happen. I am uh, okay because of lack of time. I didn't touch on that one. Um, uh, whenever there has been a crash, uh, people immediately try to actually retrieve the black box because the black box actually contains all the recordings. So if the pilots were too preoccupied, many times you will find the pilots have no time to respond to the ground even because they'll be taking emergency decisions on the spot. 
and they'll be talking to each other and trying to you know somehow salvage the situation and keep the plane afloat and they have no time to communicate or even tell the ground control what is the problem with the plane so all these things will have to clearly come out you know based on the recordings what is really gone so this uh, black box will record the communication and also the parameters of various systems all things are monitored and recorded in the black box so that is why after every crash there is always an attempt to immediately recover the uh, black box because you know let me tell you one more thing this uh, after especially a crashes and so on you know there will be a lot of um, uh, litigation and cases and so on so the airlines will have to spend a huge amount of insurance money and so on so the first attempt after each crash will be they'll try to blame the pilot any aircraft crash you will see the first attempt will be blame the pilot he is no more there anyway poor fellow cannot def defend himself he is gone so blame the pilot and escape this is what almost all airlines do that and so only for the truth to come out you have to wait for the black box and then it has to be examined by independent people you cannot hand over to the simple airline that fellow will bluff something so it's the one of the most important things the pieces of evidence and also technical analysis for you to know what happened you need the black box yes sir uh, can you tell the difference between different jet engines like ramjet turbofan etc okay see aeroplanes are turbojets turbofans essentially airplanes use aeroplanes use mostly turbine gas turbines what we call they are uh, basically turbo turbojet engines and you can sometimes call it as they are again classified in different ways like turbofan engines bypass engines and so on um, whereas when you talk about ramjet that is a entirely different class of engine a ramjet engine see a turbine is actually full of moving parts you have a compressor you have a combustion chamber you have a turbine full of rotating play, uh, blades and rotors and uh, etc etc so that is what is a turbine with air flows and go out whereas a ramjet essentially you know it ramps the air already you need to have a speed for the ramjet to produce thrust the turbine engine the gas turbine engine the turbofan turbojet etc they can start from zero speed and then fly the plane completely by themselves whereas a ramjet engine cannot start from zero speed and fly a plane you have to already give it a velocity and then only the ramjet can start and fly so that's the basic difference between a ramjet engine and a simple turbine engine or a gas um, uh, turbojet engine and the scramjet engine is uh, a different form of a ramjet engine where the combustion process takes place at supersonic speeds so these are the three different types of engines are are you clear i hope i have been able to explain to you dipthi i think there are two more questions yes, after sir. that we will yes, come sir. to a close and then we will if anybody wants further to interact as usual we will have about 5 to 10 minutes if it is okay with jasper okay yes sir okay the two more questions yes sir uh, what is the most recurring problems that lead to plane crash okay see um, if you look at aeroplane uh, crashes the majority of the crashes actually uh, take place during take off and landing you, know, you can see the the uh, during cruise phase essentially or in equilibrium flight there is very rarely crash almost all accidents happen during landing and take off these are the real critical uh, you know nine sir will tell you in a rocket engine in a rocket plane you know we talk about ignition transient and tail off transient which actually are more troublesome than a steady burn time in the ballistic same way in a flight uh, aeroplane take off and landing are really critical whereas um, you know steady flight is almost always without any problem and so take off and landing where complete changes take place you are coming into land the runway conditions the landing wind conditions cross flow conditions visibility you have thousand problems which can cause you trouble you know if the ground uh, uh, friction is not enough you overshoot the runway you have no visibility you keep flying around turbine fuel and so on. so take off also equally critical if you are not built up enough velocity by the time you are leaving the ground and so on so it is these two things which are really critical especially landing so uh, the cruise phase is actually not so much worrisome so um, i hope i answered the question what was the question again can you please repeat it last question Dipti, uh, 
electrical uh, what is the most recurring problem which lead to plane crash yeah so i told you so it is the landing time only landing is the phase which actually i think even more than take off landing is the time where you have more crashes in uh, crash landing and so on so i think it is either poor visibility or weather conditions and so on mostly it must be that problem only. i think so i think it is weather conditions and visibility and uh, and then uh, so on yes sir uh, the last question yes okay oh. Yeah. Okay. Last. Question. Anyway, you raise that last question. You complete that. Uh, what is your opinion on uh, flying cars? Flying car. Flying cars. Flying. Yeah, yeah. Car. That, that's nice. Yeah. I recently saw some videos of the flying cars. I was. Uh, it's nice. It looks good, and you know, uh, I don't know how far practical it is, but it looks good. It looks. I think probably there. I think in the James Bond movies of nineteen sixties, <laughs> they would have used <laughs> flying cars. I have no idea. If you watch the zero zero seven, not not seven movies, you might find flying cars. But uh, nowadays they are taking it more seriously. And another thing which I found equally interesting was this jet packs. You know, people are now individually you can fly using jet packs. Balancing will be a problem till you catch it, but then you can fly using jet packs. So these flying cars, jet packs, etc., are definitely good developments. And uh, we have to wait to see how they come up in the future. Okay. Okay, just for all that was a wonderful lecture. so we will continue now over to our a very warm good evening to one and all i kripa sophie david from rajgiri public school kalamashiri deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks from the first flights of the right brothers 100 years ago today's aircrafts have evolved into spectacular flying machines bigger faster and much more powerful i would like to thank the chief guest of the day mr c jasper lal group head vikram sarabhai space center for enlightening us with his knowledge and giving deep insights on the incredible world of flying machines thank you sir i would like to thank rajgiri school choir who led us in prayer I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Reverend Dr. K. Jameson, Associate Director of JMM Study Center, and Dr. K. Nainen, former outstanding scientist of ISRO and convener of the program, for organizing the lecture series by eminent personalities in the field of science and technology, pushing young minds to think scientifically and encouraging creativity. Thank you, sirs. I would like to thank Dr. Deepthi Shivadas. scientist vscc who coordinated the question and answer session so well thank you ma'am my sincere gratitude to the technical and media team comprising of reverend ashish thomas george robin thomas you chaplain mr sibi palichira and mr george umman who made arrangements for seamless zoom meeting and youtube streaming thank you sirs i thank all the teachers and well wishers for their valuable presence I thank all the students who have actively participated in the program. I thank Shri Krishna Satyajit for welcoming and introducing the chief guest. Lastly, I give Almighty God all glory for making this webinar a resounding success. Once again, thanking you all. I conclude. once again on behalf of jmm study center let me extend our thanks to jasper lal sir for the wonderful lecture literally you have lifted us to the world of flying machines very informative it was very incredible thank you sir once again thank you thank you uh the rajagiri public school kalamasheri has been the host of this program today special thanks to the principal father Kachapalli, Meena Nair teacher, and all the teaching staff and the students, those who have uh, actively participated in this program. Special thanks to Shri Krishna Satyajit and Kriba Sophia David for your welcome and what a thanks notes. Let me specially thank Reverend D. Sunil and Reverend Arun Thomas Achan. for their valuable praise and presence 
in this session. Special thanks goes to the convener of this program, Dr. K. Nainansa, Dr. Deepthi, and all the technical teams for making this program a wonderful one. Our next session will be coming Friday, which will be led by Dr. Kuncharya P. Isaac, the former Vice Chancellor of KTU and the Director of Saim Kochi. He will be dealing the topic, creativity and innovation. So see you next week. God bless us all. Now. Arunachan. Achan, please. Which I would be able to. No. Unmute it and again. Action, please check the mic. No. अच्छा वेर उन्हें डिवाइस इन जोइन जी मो प्रार्थी क्या Dewa-maya kerthawe, ini bumi dek bumi dek dalam tenem sistri dawum peribalan gunung ni ana lo. Ni janggalah snei kena dor tu stotram. Manusia ini bumiil, udhim, nyano, perijano, mukay warthi pichen algi. Padi nara tu nade dewa ni agyal nena kustudi. Nyal ke nuri mici jamam study center nade apiu kitil. Eto mani greher maya recession. Orang teri panah orang itu sakai jo. Lagu itu nebuat apa orang lelaki itu orang itu aneka kunjungan orang itu. Ia pada na bahasa itu orang bahagia maguan. Ia sakai kita ni atom anak studi. Eminent ayah leaders ni akan jangal kita terus dalam tu stok. Ini jangal kita atom sistem ayah alam jangal nalgia. Bagaiman ayah jasper sah ni orang tu prati. Dah tu ayah orang tu kerbau itu orang tu kahkan. Nenek sah ni orang kuno. James and his team are the ones who 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 are the ones Nal ketanna ini nalla samai itu naik dengan studi kuno, nalla rayatri kaya itu anak studi, windum adit tarjsha kano beri, abdi tak kerjanya snea kum yang lodo kuda itu, yang lada nes nangal ker, ini dek kruba yang lada mail par, beri nalar. Tiri aga dewa cinde kruba ya, ani gre yang lom surgiya wat kado gula, nama lebar odung gula, nama dae padanet odung gula. 
ജയമംസന്റെ പ്രവർത്തനങ്ങളോട് കൂടി we can continue with the question and answer yeah. okay so as usual i request that be disciplined as asking questions everybody everybody starts asking questions together then it will be difficult to answer so we have no. maximum 10 minutes right? we have yeah, yeah. by 8 thank you okay sir yes please go ahead sir good evening i am milan abraham vargis very evening to you this okay. sir what will the pilots do when the jet is going to explore that is going to explore okay it's a very um, very rare condition very rare condition unless you know there's a bomb on the plane um, if there's you know many times you have seen of course occasionally you have seen that people put bombs on the plane then you have a situation where the plane, uh, plane is exploding the only other time uh, or people you know they are shot down from the ground many times you see recently you found it in over uh, somewhere in uh, we have seen that planes were getting shot down from the ground missiles apart from that normally they don't explode many times planes do catch fire suppose there is an engine complaint and all that thing they may catch fire so it is entirely different from catching fire and exploding in catching fire people do have some time for reaction whereas if it is attacked by a missile or you know exploding by a bomb on board and so on the reaction time for the pilots is very less so usually if there's a um, uh, engine fire and so on you know they have a set procedure to be followed these pilots are all usually extremely well trained and they'll have uh, you know um, uh, written down procedure checklist based procedures which they will follow and uh, try to you know uh, safely land the plane so so there's a clear difference between explosion and also a fire on the plane okay totally different thing so in a in you, case sir. of fire they get time for reacting and planning so they there go was to... a deva sagar patil raise the hand yes, yes. other question if you are there otherwise the next person okay so i am rohan dev sir anjit Yes. what happens when the pilot uh, ejects and the parachute doesn't deploy gone <laughs> gone poor fellow is gone nothing much to say you know nothing much can be done if the pilot you know pilot ejects and uh, the parachute doesn't deploy i mean god save him that's all nothing else nothing else can be done navadita krishna please sir i have two questions about uh, hindustan aeronautics limited yeah uh, the first one is uh, we have been building fighters we have been building helicopters we have been building very high end machines but why can't we focus on something that may fit the civilian market say some uh, civilian aircraft also my second question is uh, we have been uh, building this russian aircraft in our own land in india we have been building with the help of hal uh, if russia one day ceases to supply parts can we build the aircraft by ourselves uh, in hal we have the full technology transfer and everything okay see um, in most of these uh, uh, technology transfers you know something will be held back by the original com- country some things will be held back by the original country uh, i was for example explain to you people about the mig 25 plane you know which is one of the greatest planes easily one of the best planes ever and you know we have used it continuously till around 2004 or 5 and uh, we would have still like to use it because we don't have anything to replace mig 25 but then we were forced to stop because russia stopped production the russians have gone on to other things and they ceased production by around 2004 or 5 and so we had no way of getting spare parts because some of these components the technology will not be given some of the especially engine components you know um, things will be still held back by the original company or the country they will only certain pieces so much of the other things will be transferred whereas certain critical elements they will hold back so without that you will not be able to do much so i think uh, there's a thing if uh, suppose uh, there are there are on the other hand maybe mig 21 and things like that which are completely transferred over the last 30 40 years which we are making ourselves totally which we can continue which may not be technologically a threat at all to other countries suppose now russia and so over everything is outdated plane mig 21 for example is outdated so by transferring totally 100% nobody is under any the original developer has nothing to lose so they may transfer on the other hand with top class plants nobody will transfer the 100% of the technology 
So that answers, I think, one part of your question. And the second part of your question about the transport plane, you know, you are even military plane. Where again, the military plane, I'm not sure about 100% technology transfer. Suppose you are, you are asking about the Sukhoi 30 and other planes like that. I don't know whether the 100% components are made in-house. I doubt very much. I'm sure that some of the critical engine elements will be supplied by um, the Russians themselves. And uh, so we'll be still dependent on them for the later planes. When this plane, another 20 years down the line, when this becomes outdated, they may give you everything. By that time, there'll be far better planes. So that is one thing. Second thing, an aircraft development takes 20 years minimum. Suppose you are talking about, you know, Air, Airbus, Boeing, all these people start developing an airplane 20 years in advance at least. It takes 15 to 20 years minimum for you to bring it to flight. And then market conditions keep on changing. Airbus A380, for example, I showed you A380, which is the largest passenger plane flying today. About 20 years back when they started this plane, they thought there will be a huge market for that. Today they find there is no market. They closed down the production. Believe it or not, Airbus A380 production is stopped now because there are no takers. Each plane must be costing thousands and thousands of crores. So this is all a very fluidic situation where investment is a high risk. The R&D, technology, competition, etc. are top class, you know, cutting edge. And there is no way for you, no time is given you for developing and playing. Either you buy the thing and survive. So once you have started lagging here, we are continuing to lag only. There is very little scope for us to catch up. And especially again in the military, there is one more aspect, you know, these are all big business, huge business. So most countries will try to pressurize you to buy their products. You can see USA, for example, when they enter into an agreement with a country, they'll try to dump, you know, many aircraft and, you know, so many defense equipment on them, on the third world country. They don't want you to develop. So these are all things which inhibit, especially the lead time and the technology involved. Already, for example, if you go for an engine development, it will take you 20, 25 years to develop and perfect an engine. So by the time you start from scratch now and develop an engine, you are totally outdated. You have no time. Already there are 10 new planes in the field by that time. So it's a kind of a vicious cycle, which is actually, you know, holding us in this problem. This is a fortunate situation. Okay. Thank you. I think that question was from a parent or a <laughs> okay, okay, good. person. I so uh, uh, parents are also welcome. Very nice. In, Very the, nice. in so this session. Student actually. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Okay, uh, you see, we have another two minutes to close. Okay. Uh, sir? Yes, please. Sir, I'm Milan. I have one more doubt. Please. Sir, will a country copy a jet's design and make it in their country? Is it is banned? No, all the time, espionage is, you know, what you call espionage or spying takes place for stealing the designs. Companies spy on companies. The countries spy on countries because this is a huge business. So all the time one has to guard oneself without losing. If the design is chosen or design is stolen, then they can definitely make it. For example, I was telling you about the supersonic transport, the Concorde and the Russian equivalent, TU-144, both accuse each other of copying. They look identical. You go, and go back and see the net, you compare both these planes, they look identical. Russians accuse uh, the, the Europeans of stealing their design and Europeans accuse Russians of stealing their design. So we have no idea who stole what or independently they developed. But these kind of things happen all the time. Uh, you have to safeguard your design. Otherwise, somebody will steal it and then, you know, no qualms on this. No morals. It's business. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Jasper. It was a really wonderful uh, thank you, session. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Your thank lecture. You. Very